Hey, welcome to Whitefields Community Church Sermon Extra. Great to have you with us again this week. I'm here with Pastor Nick Katie, who is the pastor of Whitefields Community Church here in Longmont, Colorado. And we're currently in our new series uh, called... Pilgrim's Progress. That's it. Pilgrim's Progress. Just suddenly had a slip of the mind there. And I do know the title of the message was Home Away From Home. And so we got into chapter 2 of First Peter. And uh, the series, of course, uh, is Peter's letters to those, you know, in the greater Roman area or Galatia and Asia. Pontius. Yeah. yeah all those different Capitus, areas. Yeah. And uh, great themes that Peter has been getting into. And probably one of the great greatest themes that he dives into here in chapter two. And just that, you know, um, the stone which the builders reject has become the chief cornerstone. And you were discussing that there's, there's, you know, there's a biblical story arc here, a narrative that seems to go uh, through the entire Bible regarding the stone. Yeah. <clears throat> it's one of my favorite kind of topics to delve into is that throughout the Bible, there are these narrative arcs and they speak to actually, you know, the inspiration of the Bible, because it's interesting that this book written by all these different people over a long period of time has these narrative themes that continue through the different authors and are picked up um, in different stories and then culminate in Jesus, which is really cool. And so one of those is the story of the rock and, you know, it begins, well, here, what Peter quotes from, he's quoting first from Isaiah, where he talks about how the Messiah will be called the cornerstone. In other words, he's the foundation. And this is, I think this is also a really important point. The belief in the Messiah, hope in the Messiah, was the cornerstone of the Jewish belief and Jewish hope, was that one day God would send someone who would change their fate, essentially. And that person would be the Messiah. So, uh, Isaiah had said the Messiah will be the cornerstone, etc. He would also said that he will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And so what's interesting is that the Psalms talk about this story, which we talked about yesterday in the sermon, about how the cornerstone of the temple was a stone which was initially rejected. And then Jesus comes along and he applies those verses to himself. He says, remember when Isaiah talked about the stone, um, the cornerstone that would be the Messiah? He goes, that's me. I'm the cornerstone. And just like in the Psalms, when they talked about the stone being rejected, that's what has happened to me and will happen to me. Etc. Well, you could actually take that narrative story of the stone. You could go back even further. There's another related arc about the stone, and that it goes all the way back to Exodus. Do you remember that the people of Israel were in the wilderness? They um, they had prayed, God set us free. And they go through the Red Sea, and then they get there, and they quickly realize, wait a second, we've got a whole lot of people. We're in the middle of the desert, and we don't have any food or water. What are we going to do? So they start crying out to God and complaining and almost immediately complaining about how good their life was in Egypt, etc. But God tells Moses, I want you to strike this rock and then the rock will pour forth water. It's a miracle. And he does. And it's great. Well, another thing that happened, which we'll get to in a second, fast forward to Jesus and Jesus in John chapter seven is fulfilling that picture of the rock that struck in the wilderness. And what he does is, uh, it's called during the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Tents. And that was a time when the people of Israel would go and they, it was like a camping thing they would do in Jerusalem. They would live in tents for a week, and then the people would bring their sons, they'd all go up, live in tents, and it was to remember that they had dwelt in tents, their forefathers had dwelt in tents in the wilderness, and God had provided for them food from heaven and water from a rock. Well, Jesus, on the last day of that festival, he goes forth. And so many people believe that what they would do during this festival at that time is they would pour water out on the dry ground. And they would say, you know, wow, God provided for us and uh, it was a dry and thirsty land, etc. Well, Jesus goes on that last day, the great day of the festival, and he stands up in the middle of the crowds and he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And out of his inmost being will come streams of living water. It's interesting, that idea of living stones, right? Jesus is the living stone from which comes forth life. And from that life, we become living stones as opposed to inanimate objects or dead stones. And so Jesus is that living stone. He is the rock in the wilderness that was struck. You know, he's smitten on the cross so that we could have life. It's the fulfillment of that picture. 
And there's one other interesting thing in Numbers. You remember that there's another time where there's a rock that gives forth water. And Moses was told this time not to strike the rock, but to speak to the rock. But in his anger and his frustration with the people, Moses didn't speak to the rock. He struck the rock with his staff, not in obedience to God, but out of anger and frustration. In this case, misrepresenting the heart of God. Anyway, God was merciful, let water for, uh, pour forth from that rock as well, but that led to some other things like Moses not entering the promised land. But the point is that Jesus, the true rock, the true living stone who gives life to us, he was struck once and for all. He doesn't need to be struck again. And now we just speak to him and you know he pours forth life. Oh, wow. No, that's a great, that's a great to see how, especially through the whole Bible, this particular story arc continues and we can see it here. Peter points it out for us. And one of also the great things that we see uh, throughout scripture is that, you know, the, the institution of the priesthood and the, and, the, and the tribe of Levi and all that stuff. But then you come to the New Testament and, you know, up until that point, up until Jesus died, you know, nobody could go to the Holy of Holies. It was forbidden only for those select few and we see that the you know the curtain that separated that in the temple it was torn in two which representing the fact that we as as the children of God now can come boldly to the throne room of grace and and Peter points that out here uh, you know in in this chapter he says there in in verse 9 because you are a chosen chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation his own special people and you had talked about a little bit that about that on on Sunday morning as well yeah, I think that idea of the priesthood is really interesting. Uh, you know, we talked about how it, we present sacrifices. That's what he says there in verse 4 and 5. Uh, in verse 5, he talks about us presenting sacrifices. But this idea of being a priesthood was more, the priests didn't just present sacrifices. They also taught the people, like we see uh, in certain places in the Old Testament. Their job was to make the law known to the people. But it was also, they had this ministry of, you could say, representing God before the people and representing the people before God. And essentially, that's what we're called to do as a royal priesthood. Every one of us is called into the ministry. And what does that mean? Well, it means in, in various ways, in various expressions, we represent God before people. And that might mean talking to them about God. It might mean serving them in Jesus' name, being the hands and feet, you might say, of Jesus for the world. But also, we represent people before God, so we intercede for people. We pray for them on their behalf. Just like we see so many times in the Bible, like with Moses and with Abraham, interceding for people um, before God. We see that's a priestly function. Yeah, we're called to minister to God and called to minister to God's God's people. Yeah, definitely a very, very rich chapter. We can conti we'll continue uh, next week, uh, starting in verse 13. But, uh, and of course, I hope you join us when you do that. But if you didn't mi miss the uh, sermon on Sunday morning, whitefieldschurch.com, you can download it right there. And there are a lot of other resources that are up there. You probably can even subscribe to our newsletter if you want to do that. Uh, get us on Spotify and Google Play and Apple Music for our podcast. And then, of course, uh, YouTube. And we are now putting up our sermons up there on YouTube. So if you subscribe to our channel, uh, you'll get notified each time that there is a new a new content for you to to view. And so we just we love hearing from you. Any uh, comments, suggestions, questions you might have, we'd love to to talk about those. And uh, we hope to see you again next week. God bless. <laughs>